Hailing from the Jersey Shore and raised as athletes, the Airy Bros have always shared a passion for physical culture, athletic performance, and human optimization, always striving to be the strongest versions of themselves, mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Along the way, they've met some pretty amazing humans and have had some pretty epic adventures. The intention of Airy Bros Radio is to showcase these amazing people and the impact that they've had on them and to share tips, tricks, and hacks so that you can win each day, every day. When I backyard wrestled, we weren't doing it to film it. We were doing it to do it. Um, big difference between what the reasons people do stuff nowadays. I, and it wasn't while I was there that I got all the benefits. It was leaving Peru, coming home for a day, and flying out to PWG Battle of Los Angeles and wrestling Chris Hero. Uh, that's where I got my love for wrestling back. If you don't have a plan, then you become part of someone else's plan. We get there, we sweep, we mop, we do all the little things, and then we get in there and we pray to the wrestling god. I don't want to call it the greatest decision I've made, because who really makes the decisions? It's just, uh, you know, I, I really paid attention to the sign. Serendipity always follows these stories, and I know if you listen to Terrence McKenna, they always talk about how there's certain, like, something out of the ordinary will happen, and then the synchronicities line up, and somebody ends up offering you such and such. Everything that I've done in my entire life led me down the path that it leads you to. Hey, this is Matt Seidel. You're listening to Airy Bros Radio. What up, y'all? This is Airy Bros Radio, and this is episode 34 with Matt Seidel. You ready, Prince? Ready as I'll ever be, Richie Rich. I'm ready to give Airy Bros Radio Matt Seidel, also known as Evan Bourne in the WWE. Yo, don't be alarmed. Stick around. Stay tuned. Tune in. Just because Matt's a professional wrestler doesn't mean you need to touch that dial. He's got a lot of things going on. He's been a lot of places. He's done a lot of things. He's seen a lot of shit. And you're going to want to hear all about it because we get into all that from his journey down into the jungle of Peru to his time in a Japanese jail cell and everything in between. Matt's got a lot of cool shit going on. He talks about all that stuff, gets into it with us. This is a cool conversation. I'm not a wrestling fan, professional wrestling fan, but I can get down with Matt Seidel. That is awesome to hear, Richie Rich. Before we ever had a podcast, before we ever thought about this, I was listening to podcasts with Matt Seidel, talking about some of the things he talks about on this podcast. So to be able to link up with Matt, get him on the phone for 50 minutes, and pick his brain about life and everything in between is very special to me. And just to know that you enjoyed this one, coming from a professional wrestler, and you were into this podcast, I already know it's a win. Yo, when someone brings up Ram Dass or Jack Cornfield, I'm in. Terrence McKenna. I'm in. I'm in. 100. So, get your pen, get your paper. Matt drops some knowledge here. He talks about some of the work he's done to be a better person, uh, be more positive, be more grateful. And I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you all do as well. This is episode 34 of Airy Bros Radio. You got anything else, Prince? Let's just do that shooting star press right on into this thing, Richie Rich. I don't even know what that means. Sit back, relax, enjoy today's episode of Airy Bros Radio. Much love, namaste, from the boys of 1512. All right, ladies and gentlemen, 
Welcome to Airy Bros Radio. This is Matt Seidel, professional wrestler, psychonaut. Matt, welcome to the show. Greetings. How you doing today? Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Good, yeah, so uh, like, you know, Jimmy's a huge wrestling fan, and he brought you to my attention, and then some of your other uh, escapades, I guess we could say, has uh, kind of piqued my interest in, in who you are and what you got going on. So if you mm-hmm. could just real quick give us a little bit of background about kind of where you're coming from and how you got into wrestling and then how that led you into, uh, you know, finding out about ayahuasca and some of those experiences. Sure, yeah. So I am a professional wrestler named Matt Seidel. I currently live in Clearwater, Florida. I started out as just a regular kid from Missouri. I grew up in St. Louis. Both my parents were school teachers. Um, And I kind of became obsessed with wrestling in my youth and not just obsessed with watching it, um, my obsession was more with like repeating what I saw on my trampoline in my backyard. And then that, per- that steadily progressed into a thing called backyard wrestling, which was all the rage in the 90, in the late nineties amongst the kids. Uh, you know, well, not, not really the rage, but it was certainly something <laughs> that we were asked to not try at home. Uh, every time we'd watch WWE programming, it said, do not try this at home. And then that's what me and my friends did. And um, from there, I just I, I followed it uh, with, I guess, a lot of passion and vigor and ended up wrestling in Japan, wrestling for WWE, wrestling um, at all, all, all sorts of famous and wonderful people. And uh, now I'm a wrestling coach as part time. And then the rest of the time, I'm still active wrestling all over the world. I've been this year. I just went to England, Israel. Germany. I mean, it's uh, it's a pretty good life. It's a unique industry, but um, I've got a, quite the passion for it. It's my particular, what would you call it, a performing art, you know, and uh, for people who get it, you know, there's no explanation needed, and if you don't get it, you know, I'm not going to bother trying to explain it to you because it doesn't bother me because, mm-hmm. you know, not everything's for everyone, but uh, the people that wrestling connects to, we all have a certain particular bond that whether you're a wrestler or a fan, whatever it is, it's sort of a, a common ground to start at where uh, you speak a similar language about your passion. And, um, you know, that's what I really love about wrestling. There's a great community around it. That's what's kept me in it. And uh, that's sort of what I do. And so coming up, oh. uh, I was gonna, coming up, were you an athlete? Did you play sports in high school or anything? Or did you just kind of gravitate towards that and, and ran with it? Well, I, I, I was athletic, but I, I was more like, I didn't really dig team sports. I, I didn't like all the rest blaming and the, oh, so-and-so should have hit a home run, or if you know if you guy hadn't dropped the ball, we'd have won. I kind of like sports that are one-on-one. I like martial arts. Um, I like jumping around on my trampoline. Yeah, and I really just, uh, I really took to, to pro wrestling because I love the idea of the performance art. And like, when I was a kid, we would even choreograph fight scenes you know, pretending to be stunt men, and uh, I think that sort of morphed into whatever it is I do now. So, are there any of those old school videos floating around on YouTube? Like, it's so funny um, because it's not. I know there's not. I mean, it, when I backyard wrestled, we weren't doing it to film it; we were doing it to do it. Um, it's a big difference between what the reasons people do stuff nowadays. You know, we just had it in us. Like, we that's what you did to entertain yourselves and to have fun. We were just doing that and. Uh, so yeah, actually, with this kid, I was friends with this kid uh, who came. Anyway, I lent out all the tapes, and they never ever made it back. Oh no! <laughs> so yeah, there's... you know, I don't. Well, I mean, what am I going to do? Go back and watch? I mean, we, it, me and my brothers, we still joke about it. We still remember all the shows, and we have, you know, a, a half dozen running jokes from that, from you know, late '90s backyard wrestling that run through today. So we certainly still get our enjoyment out of it regardless of the tape. And you have a brother that's a wrestler as well, too, right? Yeah, so my older brother, Mike, is a wrestler, and uh, my younger brother, Dan, was active in the backyard days, but he has since just retired to teaching. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we started a little wrestling family, and it uh, kind of grew from there. My, my brother and I have wrestled together in Korea, in Japan, uh, Mexico. I mean, it's, it's been a pretty amazing. He was just here training with me for a month in Florida, at my wrestling school, man, he is just, uh, you know, for just technically perfect and just he has all the things that 
we, we really understand each other when it comes to wrestling. We may sometimes we don't understand each other in life, but man, <laughs> when it comes to what we like in wrestling, we both trained under SEMA and Dragon Gate. And just you know, we just see we see things the same way, and we're going for the same. We're trying to accomplish the same goals and and that kind of thing. Are you looking to start tag teaming with him more, or you prefer doing singles? Uh, I, I, tag wrestling is my favorite style. Well, six man tag wrestling is my favorite style. But uh, Mike is busy, you know, he's got his own life, and so we take the opportunities we get. So we kind of work together in Denver, and uh, we've wrestled together in Dragon Gate, but uh, it's not really um, uh, an every weekend kind of thing. I'm shooting solo most of, most of my weekend gigs. And working in Denver, is that uh, Lucha and Laughs you guys do? Yeah, it's called Lucha Libre and Laughs. Yeah. Is there another one of those coming up? I've been, I see them in the local paper every once in a while since we've been down yeah. here. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm not exactly sure when the next one is. Uh, I thought I was going to come back out there in September, but it looks like it might not be until closer to the end of the year or 2020. But they've got, I mean, those shows are always worth checking out. They're a ton of fun to be at. All right, we'll put that on the calendar for sure. You you had mentioned all the different places you were just recently. Do you prefer being on the road? Is that kind of kind of your passion, being out there traveling, or do you prefer being in Clearwater, running the school? No, yeah. Uh, so for me, especially right now, I'm 36. My I, if I never got on an airplane again, if I never stayed in a hotel, I'd be a very happy man. Uh, you know, I'm very. I like the simple life. I just I like to lay low and sit out and look at the birds and you know kind of stare at the water <laughs> you know read a book uh the thing about wrestling is it's very exciting there's a lot of sounds and lights and explosions and guys getting dropped on their head and craziness and people yelling and screaming uh so when i get home i just like it to be nice and quiet and peaceful and calm and that's kind of the only way i've managed to find balance is by being pretty laid back when it comes to the home life, like a lot of people dream of going on vacations, and I, I used to just dream of staying home. And then I realized, oh, I could do it if I just stopped take, signing contracts for different companies and became my own boss and did my own schedule. So that's what I'm doing now. And so with the busy wrestling schedule and that sort of lifestyle, um, how did you come to discover or hear about uh, ayahuasca and what, what kind of brought you down or led you to that path? I mean, that's so uh, obviously it's like everything that I've done in my entire life just led me down the path that it leads you to. Like, you know, whatever I have for breakfast helps. But I'll tell you, basically, the the day I was, serendipity always follows these stories. And I know if you listen to Terrence McKenna, they always talk about how there's certain like something out of the ordinary will happen. And then the synchronicities line up and somebody ends up offering you such and such opening your mind or enlightening you to a new perspective. That's sort of what happened to me. I met uh, a girl in in Edmonton, Canada, one night, and she rocked my world and told me about how when she was 16 to 18, she lived in Peru, and she was a bartender, and then she went to the into the forest and drank this stuff called ayahuasca, and, and it changed her life. And she was just glowing. She just had an extraordinary quality to her, and I was like, well, whatever – if it works for you, I, I'm very interested. And that was right around the same time that Joe Rogan had started talking about that. And I had been listening to his podcast, in episode one. And basically, Aubrey Marcus went on there and said he went to a place to, and did ayahuasca, and it really helped him. Uh, I, I heard that, and I said, boy, as soon as I'm done with WWE, I'll take a week or two and go down to Peru and see what happens, you know, see if that's going to be something that could help me, because I tried... The other routes, sobriety, you know, I mean, I try, you know, the, the generic prescriptions that you're offered, I kind of exhausted those. And um, yeah, so then I took the plunge. I felt the call. I went down to Peru and that, you know, uh, it was an eye opening experience. And really, there was just cultural learning, unlearning. There was just getting back in touch with, you know, my own true nature and self and taking the break from the go, 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 which was like the first chance that I remember having like, wow, I can really slow things down. And uh, the kind of healing parts went from there. And so had you had any experiences with any sort of psychedelics before you went down to Peru? Not really. I mean, I didn't know. I mean, it was very new to me. I uh, just 
just a lot of cannabis in my life. But, uh, yeah, no, I mean, and mushrooms a couple times, but not in the same, not in the same way with the same intentions or the same mindset that I did ayahuasca and wachuma. Yeah, right. Same here. And I think even if I had a little bit more experience, I still don't think it prepares you for that. And even having, uh, 11 ceremonies under my belt now I still get get jitters when I hear of a ceremony popping up or I or I sign up for one and and it's like you're going through it all over again. Yeah, I mean, you know, you go in with less I went in with less expectations, but you know, my my ayahuasca experience was I don't know if underwhelming is the right term, but that was basically what it was. It was underwhelming. Uh I really didn't um and it's hard to explain, but mine was not a visual experience. All my healing from the plant medicines really happened internally and without any external signs. No visions, no, you know, when I, when I take Wachuma, it's a little bit different. But with ayahuasca, I really felt like I got the brain um, reset. You know, when your computer glitches so hard, you got to hit that reset button. I sort of feel like that's what ayahuasca did, but without... I don't know, the neurobiology of it all is, I, I hate to make claims that are a little far out, but, uh, I mean, I think from what we've seen in, the uh, like, fMRI scans, it just helps open up pathways that allow you to, you know, make decisions differently, and it gives you the chance to uh, rethink at almost everything you're doing. I think it kind of held up a mirror to me in a lot of ways, um, but, you know, I guess that's what self-reflection always is, and... Yeah, but I mean, that it's, it, it took me out, I did five ceremonies, and then I just didn't think it was working, and my, luckily I went to one of the world's most honorable, respectable, kind, thoughtful uh, curanderos in Peru, named Don Howard Lawler, and he introduced me to Wachuma, which was really the medicine that sparked, that just re-sparked my spark in life, and really, I mean... I, and it wasn't while I was there that I got all the benefits. It was leaving Peru, coming home for a day, and flying out to PWG Battle of Los Angeles and wrestling Chris Hero. Uh, that's where I got my love for wrestling back. That's where I f- remembered who I was. I, tuned, I, I could remember the feeling. When I was in Peru and I was under the influence of Wachuma during the full-on ceremony, I remembered this time in my life when I was... 17 years old, and I was leaving wrestling training. I had probably only been training for two or three weeks, and I just went ahead and did did a bunch of moves that I hadn't been trained but I knew to do. And I, I when I left wrestling training that night, I just was on top of the world, and I, it was just a really pure feeling. And I reconnected to that in Peru, and then when I went home, I found it again, wrestling hero, wrestling at the Battle of Los Angeles, and then there was this 10-man tag where the guys did a bunch of touch butt you know there was like a conga line there was guy i mean it was just a goofy fun match but it was all the the things that are cool about pro wrestling you know the uh the fun parts of it and i just remember that oh yeah this could be a really fun thing to do and these are all my friends and i really got re it was a great recharge for me um something that i don't think i could have gotten without taking the time making the effort and i don't know what to call a sacrifice but you really have to commit to this to a, to a trip down to Peru, uh, which means you're working on yourself before you go there, and then you're working on yourself while you're there, and hopefully you remember to work on yourself when you get home. Those would be the three uh, very important elements to it. Yeah, I think one that's that's one heck of a reimmersion for you coming coming off the plane to per, from Peru and then going hopping right back into a match. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I like I literally stayed until the last possible day where I could make it back and where I could make it back to the U.S. and still make the Battle of Los Angeles. Because originally I was coming back like a week or two before it, so I would have time to relax and integrate. But I wanted to stay and do a Chuma, and the calling was there. And, uh, you know, that was, I don't want to call it the greatest decision I've made, because who really makes the decisions? It's just, uh, you know, I I really paid attention to the signs. and (laughs) You listened to the universe. That's where I was trying to go. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Did you do ayahuasca with Don Howard as well? Or was it two separate? Yes, I did. Yeah. Oh, right on. Yeah. Now, before you went down there, were you kind of over wrestling at that period in your life? Uh, no, I wasn't over wrestling by any means. I just had like 
you know, I didn't dig the the product that I was working with. It, it really wasn't that great anyway. Um, and I was just really hurt. Uh, like I had a hurt foot. I had a hurt shoulder. I was just bummed out. And I was sort of looking to open up a wrestling school slash, you know, X, Y, Z, whether it was um, flotation sensor deprivation tanks, yoga. You know, I was just thinking about taking on a business venture like a regular human who doesn't travel all the time and this, that, and the other, you know, where I would just have like uh, a more civilian life than the crazy wrestler world. But uh, the the cards were not in my favor for that. And uh, my, my gut was just like, yo, we got to keep wrestling. Uh, that's just, it's just who I am. You know, you can't fight who you are. And I, you know, I just have to get in the ring. Like it's, for me, it's, th- that's therapy. You know, I need to, uh, plants to be medicine, but getting in the ring for me is really what brings me back to who, who I am in my true nature, which is what the plant medicine kind of helps you find who you are. But then it's up to you to keep, stay with it. And, and honestly, it wasn't until I fully realized like, Hey, I got to commit. I had to just recommit to wrestling to be happy. Because when you're halfway in something, you're kind of also halfway out, and it, it puts you in a position where you can't, where you feel like you can't put 100 percent of your efforts into that because you don't really want to be doing it. And so, yeah, I just kind of reset, and you know, a couple times I've, I like, uh, you know, whenever I get injured, I do kind of worry about losing my my drive, my drive for it. But you know, just last time I dislocated my shoulder. I was like, I cut this great promo, and I was, you know, okay with not being able to come back from wrestling, not being able to come back because I've done everything I want to do. But, like I said, if there is a possibility of recovery, you'll find me in the ring. And that's just what I've done. It's taken a year or so, and then I hurt, you know, then I had a knee injury, and I just worked my way back from that. And this year's been a challenge because um, I left Impact I left my contract at Impact in January, but also needed knee surgery in January, which took me about eight months to recover from. So it's just eight months, no pay, no nothing, no, like nothing going on. I mean, outside of my school, but even then my ability to teach was limited. I had to have an assistant teacher. And, uh, you know, that's sort of the overarching theme of my career, which is the perseverance. They're not expected of someone to do what they're doing, and I just – manage to go and do it but not just like with by biting my teeth and do it i just try and go step by step when i'm rebuilding and uh luckily wrestling uh, I, if i was an mma fighter i would my career would be long since pat eclipsed however uh i'm a part of the greatest form of entertainment in the universe and i would love to have another 10 years doing it now, during those periods of time where you're inactive because you're injured, how do you keep yourself sane? What do you do to balance not being able to go in the ring? Because that seems like it's an outlet for you. What What is your outlet now when you're injured and, and you can't go in the ring? Yeah, well, I've never claimed to be sane. Just, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. It's like, I definitely don't have any answers because when you're not, when, when I'm hurting and I'm not feeling like myself, it can be challenging to be around me. You know, you can really lose, like, um, a lot of my sense of self is tied to my physical abilities. Like, my ability to move like a ninja used to be how I defined myself. But basically, after I broke my foot, I mangled my foot in a uh, motorcycle accident. And it was at that point, that was, and kind of when I went down to Peru, was the time I realized, boy, I better stop associating myself with my body, otherwise I'm going to be very disappointed as we go on for the next hopefully 80 or 90 or 120 years, whatever it is, it's just uh, the more the more I consider who I am, my body, the less happy I'm going to be because it keeps it continues to fail, not fail me, but it can't do the same things it used to do, and uh, I have to just adjust. And really it has made my wrestling game so much better because the cerebrality of my approach to the ring has completely changed and uh, I really feel like I'm doing my best work. And although, I mean, I, I, I would step back if I didn't think I was doing it, but I really feel like I am at the top of my game, and hopefully like I can keep my body maintaining this with a smart schedule and a working good opponents and just kind of keep, keep um, using the opportunities to wrestle as opportunities to give back to people in this field. 
a lot of the way I learned, you know, I went to, I told you I went to a wrestling school, but it wasn't really a wrestling school. It's just some guys who said they, they knew how to wrestle, uh, but also had a ring and just charged me basically the same price I, I charge people to train nowadays, which is insane. However, um, what happened, the reason I started to really learn wrestling was when older wrestlers or veterans would give back by just by wrestling me, by watching my matches, by helping me, by criticizing me, by yelling at me, all those things. And, um, so now for me, as much as I enjoy performing and being in high pressure situations, I don't necessarily need accolades. What makes me more satisfied is, uh, helping out and being a, a part of moving the wrestling industry in the right direction, you know, whether it's locker room activity, locker room behavior, in ring stuff, uh, or just, you know, in general being there as uh, a person younger wrestlers can go to to ask questions. Touching on you talking about being a coach, what is your philosophy in your school, how you teach wrestlers, and how you go about that? Oh, I mean, you could call me Mr. Miyagi if you'd like. <laughs> no, I, uh, so the, for me, the, the approach to wrestling is I, I take a very Japanese approach, but my, the Japanese approach that I learned came from, uh, also it came from Mexico. So it's very, a very combinatory style of what I, what I try and teach is something that'll work in, that you'll be able to use in every locker room across the world. But it really does begin with, taking care of the gym we get there we sweep we mop we do all the little things and then we get in there and we pray to the wrestling gods but if you don't work for it if you don't earn it then you never enjoy it and uh you know we would just try and keep things uh i take it very seriously but i try not to take myself too seriously um the the if i have students that like to have fun during class I ask those ones to be quiet. Those the ones that are quiet during class, I ask them to be louder. You know, we're, we're, we work on uh, every aspect of it. But I really believe in an individual approach to training because everybody has different strengths and weaknesses. However, I do ask when it comes to physical activities, I really do ask, you know, the same thing of everyone. And I hope that pushes people out of their comfort zone. And I think that's sort of my job as a coach to – mainly focus on the things that people aren't good at because you always, you know, if a guy at the gym has a big chest, he's always at the gym working chest. He doesn't need me to tell him do a chest press. You know, they need me to, the the guys that are the best wrestlers in my class, those are the guys that do promo class the most often. The ones that tell you they're good talkers, those are the ones you'll see me making sweat in the ring and run and run and run. I mean, that's just a good approach to teaching. And I, I I do believe that the Japanese approach is good, which is just, becoming so physically tough that you can do things ordinary people can't you can do those things daily without being hurt or hardly even having a mark whereas like you know we in japan sometimes after the show uh you go out to a meal with like the local towns person or somebody who is a sponsor of the event and sometimes these events will devolve into uh, chopping fans and kind of real fun, more like a party than uh, dinner. And um, sometimes there's the, the fans ask to be chopped, and you and, uh, and a wrestler will give them a chop, and the one chop in their chest starts just bleeding immediately, bright red handprint and blood coming out. Um, if you're a Japanese wrestler, you can get chopped 20 or 30 times, and you hardly turn red. That, that's because we train hard. You know, they like. My, when my brother was in the drag bait dojo, they would do and he would be doing a neck bridge, which is like a back bend, but you only use your head and not your hands. So you know, uh, you're you're basically posting on your head and your two feet. And then they would sit on his stomach, putting that extra weight on him. Uh, that's kind of how dedicated they are to training hard and um, separating themselves from other people just through your dedication and the hours you put in. Because everybody starts out, you know, regular. I mean, for me, if you start, if you want to join the rest, professional wrestling, uh, becoming an amateur wrestler is the best approach because you're halfway there um, in terms of your physical conditioning and your body awareness and your movement. Like that's why guys who do jujitsu, the Kyle O'Reillys, Bobby Fish, Muay Thai. I mean, the, the guys who can do 
other things or also make great wrestlers. Um, but I really believe that. So, for example, somebody like my brother, Mike. Mike was not the most athletic kid. He didn't play any sport. I, I don't remember him ever being athletic until he was in his 30s and he committed so hard to being a wrestler that he studied gymnastics, Muay Thai, wrestling, and then became an athlete. And it just goes to show you that it's what you are is not dependent on what you are today. It's what you see yourself as in the future and work, work towards. So whatever you see yourself in, you know, six months from now and work towards that, that's what you're going to be. And if you don't, if you're, if you don't have a plan, then you become part of someone else's plan. And so with that in mind and talking about, you know, doing the work on the front end and then also doing the work on the back end with reintegration, do you have any sort of daily practices or daily intentions that you come at each day with to, to kind of set yourself up for success or, or to level up? Uh, yeah, so I think for me the most helpful thing is, is meditation. And I always heard people say that, and I didn't believe that that was really a thing that, I don't know, anybody actually did. But uh, me and my girlfriend started a practice where we're doing it at morning and night or morning and night or occasionally just sit in the shower and meditate. I mean, uh, walking meditation, just making myself aware of my breath and slowing down is when I start, you know, to, to stay in that right frame. And I almost always go from slowing down and taking that deep breath, almost always into a state of gratitude for kind of where I'm at and what's going on in my life. And even, you know, even now, like you're not, you know, we're worrying about how we're paying the mortgage this, this month and all that stuff. I'm just grateful for it all. And like, just grateful for my health as much as I complain about it. I'm much more grateful than, uh, ungrateful. I think it's just, man, it's just, it's, it's, I'm constantly in a state of awe which is the beginning of the word awesome, but I'm literally just in awe, awe of the technology that surrounds us, awe of all, like, how, we, how we're born into a world that has computers and the Internet, and I had nothing to do with it. You know, I'm, I don't know how to build a plane. When, when my flight's delayed and uh, people are complaining about it, I always say, well, go build yourself a plane <laughs> and then call me, because for, for me it's like just be grateful that a plane's going to get us halfway around the world in a day for a reasonable price and you know that's the that's sort of my take on it is that we just like live in this amazing world with all these opportunities so there's no reason to be ungrateful but that's easy to say now when i when i can remember to be grateful but there was a ton of time in my life where you know i I just did that wasn't part of the cycle of thinking that i was participating in and so it's like you're either in a positive cycle where things are moving in the right direction or a negative mindset cycle where things are moving in the other direction. And I sort of think I, I didn't have the discipline in place to, um, to maintain. Like, so when I, I mean, I, I struggled a lot after my plant ceremonies, after rediscovering myself, after all that, because, well, I mean, the, the book I'm reading right now is called After the Ecstasy, The Laundry, which is a book by Jack Cornfield who's a Zen meditator guy of some sort of the, in the Ram Dass realm of family of meditators. So I'm a big Ram Dass listener and I, and I love reading his books and, you know, Alan Watts and Terrence McKenna, but the, the Jack Cornfield book called after the ecstasy, the laundry is basically about, Hey, no matter how good things get, there's still laundry to do. No matter how beautiful, like you might have a glimpse of illuminate of enlightenment, but, you know, there's always the next day, there's the job, there's the kids, there's the climate change, there's, you know, there's all these other things, and it's just sort of how to appreciate not only, like, the dramatic awe and beauty of the world, but also just the day-to-day stuff. Like, one of my favorite Zen sayings is, chop wood, carry water. Like, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. And so... When I put on a podcast and do the dishes, you know, for me, that's chopping wood and carrying water. It's just the stuff you have to do every day, no matter what. I always have to wake up and make eggs. You know, there's always there's always something to do every day. There's never a day. You can't take a day off from life. So it's like uh, when you're it's, it's enjoying going with the flow as opposed to resisting it. 
I love hearing your perspective. You're definitely talking our language right now. We're over here smiling at each other through the glass, saying stuff we talk to each other about all the time. So I appreciate that. And you had said that, you know, there was still work to be done after your ceremonies and you weren't necessarily in the best place, still had work to do. But from an outsider looking in, uh, looking at your wrestling career, you seemed on fire for that period of time. Um, you were over in New Japan with Ricochet, uh, Tag Champs. Everything seemed to be going super epic. And then I went on F4W online one day, and I saw that Matt Seidel had went to jail in Japan. Um, just speak on that experience and how you were able to kind of use your practices or your work with plant medicine to get through that if you were able to tap into that? No, I mean, no way. It was, I mean, like, yeah, like, I, I don't know how to, I can't talk too well about a traumatic event that I'm still traumatized from and haven't even still processed. I mean, you got to understand it's, uh, that, that it's very severe. What, what, you know, when you get whisked away from an airport to a police detention center and held for quite some time, um, for something that any, any logical person can comprehend, that uh, the the current policy towards all drugs is wrong and needs to be adjusted based, adjusted based on facts. I mean, my, my personal policy, I believe in a thing called harm reduction. You know, so anytime people talk to me about this, I just like to talk to them about harm reduction because you know, that's a that's a fight that's worth pushing pushing forward. Because you know, whatever happened to me, I mean, it, it is what it is. But there's, I mean, we live in a world wherein. In Illinois, people are getting their marijuana convictions expunged. In the neighboring state, there's people still being arrested and put in jail for it. I mean, any like, and and it's a it's a public health issue. Any if drugs are a problem, it's a public health issue, not a criminal issue. Um, have you heard of the of a guy named Dr. Gabor Mate? Oh yeah. yes. Yeah, I mean, like he's just my god when it comes to this kind of thing. A, he just really has uh, an enlightened perspective on on harm reduction and how to anybody people who have addictions, whether it's being a shopaholic addicted to sex, love, men, women, whatever, uh, cannabis, crack, whatever it is, it's nobody's doing that because like it's not the party that people that, that the pun people really get off on punishing drug users. What they should get off on is helping them. Because these are people who are only taking substances because they hurt or are in pain or to numb themselves so that they can go on and survive another day. These are people who are hurting. They're the most marginalized population, and they're the ones that need the most support and care. And if, if you punish people who are in the weakest state, who, who literally can't fight back, um, it really, it, it to me, it goes along with my feeling that the people who put people in jail are the ones that belong in jail. Because I know if I was in charge, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be putting people in cages like this. It's um, very uh, inhuman. I mean, I accept my punishment in Japan and all that. Like, because to me, I can't worry about that. It's you know, you, you do it and you're done, and you just try and uh, move move along. And really, I just try to apologize because I felt really bad. You know, I let when you let people down that matter to you, there's no worse feeling. So I don't, I can't dwell on that because it just makes me feel horrible and it's really painful. Um, yeah, so that's why it's, I, I the, the, what's painful to me is that it's still happening to other people, not me, and it's just been systematically happening in the United States for a long time. We have 2.2 million prisoners. There's not 2.2 million bad people around here. I can guarantee you that. There's de And a lot of the people in American jails right now are just being held there because they didn't have cash for bail. Uh, I mean, we, we've... Anyway, I'll, I'll stop my, my rant by just saying, please, can we just elect Bernie Sanders and get over this? <laughs> well, and the other thing, too, is they might, you know, go in for a nonviolent drug offense and be a really good person, but they may come out on the other side. And, and being in a cage uh, with, with other people who may not be good people, that, that can definitely have an impact and change who you are coming yeah. out on the other end. Yeah. So. Yeah, or even people who just go into simple rehab facilities, go into a rehab looking for help, meet up with a bunch of people who are less uh, kind than they, and you end up in a really bad situation. I mean, it's, you, you, become, you are your environment. If, if you put prisoners in an environment of love and care and tolerance with, around nature, 
they will respond. You put people in cement walls with cages and guns and sticks and rocks and sharp things, they will respond in kind. It's very simple. It's not, I mean, a, a, you, a, seed, like a person's going to be a person. It's the environment that you grow the seed in that is the result of the plant you get. And most of these people in prison, I mean, even the worst offenders, man, it's, you know, they, that cycle got started in their early childhood and, you know, was never fixed or solved because we tell people who are, we tell people who are addicts, well, you have a disease, you have a problem, when really, you know, they, they have pain and they have hurt, but it's not some unsolvable thing. Uh, and I, I really just like to tell people that, that, you know, what I like to tell people is that every time you're looking for the answers outside yourself, you'll never find it. Even if you get to the top of the mountain, whether it's finding God or getting rich or whatever it is, that never solves the problem. It's always an internal solution where you have to adjust your internal space to be somewhere where you can be satisfied or happy. Or Like I say, like, you know, it's, I, it's a lot of hard work for me to be happy, and that's sort of, you know, it's sort of on me to be happy, but it's with other people that I find my joy. So you can be happy, but you can't really be alone. Like, there's so many things that... I, I sort of am just running down a bunch of different forks <laughs> in the go road. Go with it. But we I, but love I, it. <laughs> but I really feel... Yeah. But, I, you know, I just... Uh, I find, like, it's my uh, it's my duty to find my happiness when I leave the house so I can, like, treat everybody like they're another person, like they're... And, I, and so it's... Uh, I just heard a, a great story, and it's about, like, these gourds. Or, yeah, gourds. You know, I guess it's this time of year where we can talk about gourds. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like all these gourds, there's like two, there's gourds on one side and then there's a gourds on the other side and they start like yelling at each other and they're, 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 all of a sudden they decide they're about to go kill each other. And then the farmer comes down and says, stop guys, I want you all to put your hands on top of your head and just wait here and take 10 deep breaths. And after they do that, he goes, okay, now what do you feel? And they say they feel the stem that connects to the vine, and then they all notice that, well, guess what? They're all connected. They're all from the same vine. And um, I think if we had a physical, if we were somehow had strings come up out of our feet that connected us to the earth, people would see it better. But what we have is people forgetting that we're all connected, and when you forget that, you're, it's much easier to act selfishly and unconsciously of the people around you, which is like the, like, that's why I love Japan so much, because they are community-based people. They, they do things with the assumption that a neighbor is going to come by so that you want to leave things better than you found it. You make sure there's room for the other person. When you stand on the escalator going up, you stand on the right side, leaving the left open in case anyone needs to run who's late. I mean, that, that's the kind of society I want to build, which is why like, I can never talk trash on Japan because basically I love everything about them except for the, the laws they put into place after the U.S. forced them to after World War II. But don't get me started on my anti-war <laughs> policy because I can go on forever. Guys, Guys, I have uh, I have to get ready for my wrestling class. I'm I'd be happy to talk again later. We can get deeper into any of the practices, and I'll be a little bit less spaced out for it. No, we but, would. Uh, thanks for thanks for chatting. Yeah, we would love to have you uh, back on. We'll connect with you, and uh, we really appreciate your time. Have a great class tonight. Uh, if you want, real quick, just shout out your social medias and stuff like that. Yes, yeah, so you can find me on Instagram, uh, M A T T S Y D A L Matt Seidel on Instagram. Um, you can look me up on that, and that's that's a great way to get a hold of me. But my my email is Matt Fidel at Yahoo for you know things that can't be expressed publicly. I'm always happy to talk, and you know I'll just do the best I can. If uh, people are looking to join the wrestling school, I highly encourage that, or just join any wrestling school anywhere uh, because it's fun. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate your time. You're epic. Keep on doing the great work you're doing. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Have a great night. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, that was sick. We got to get him back on. I told you, bro. Matt Seidel's the man, dude. We might have we might have waited for an hour and a half, but it was worth it. No, I mean I, that was that was well worth it. And like you said, we we should definitely try to see if we can get him on next week, or when I get back from Michigan. But I would like to either have a two parter or just kind of splice splice the episodes together. But um, yeah, I mean there was a lot of stuff and that goes back to being on the phone versus how you know there's some you know he gets going and there's some things i want to inflect upon and you know like talking about like i used to get so pissed at people when they're like yeah you know happiness is a choice 
I'd be like, fuck you, you know what I mean? Like, I'm fucking scrapping to try to fucking get my groceries for this week and keep a roof over my head in, in Southern California, and, and, you know, you're telling me it's a choice. But over time, you know, from 2012 to 2013 to 2019, putting in the work and doing the meditations, doing the journaling, and just appreciating the clouds, you know, all these things, and then retraining the mind to get out of that negative hamster wheel and be on a positive hamster wheel you're like yeah it is a choice i could i could be down right now and and worrying about this that and the other thing or i can be like you know what i've got everything i need for right now and then some so i'm going to go out and charge a day you know so that was one of the things i wanted to kind of inject i also wanted to ask him if he's banned from japan yeah, he's got he's got shirts on his pro wrestling tees, or he did that say banned in Japan. Oh, right on. Yeah, um, you know, chop wood, carry wood, right? It, speaking to me, and it's great to hear someone who's positive to say, "Hey, I'm not always fucking positive. I actually have to put a lot of work in, and I have to be present and aware of where I am at all times to have that mindset." and I can appreciate that because those are the same struggles I have, same you have. And, you know, you hear a lot of these people preaching PMA and it's PMA, always positive, always positive. But that's just not realistic. Life isn't always like that. And to have someone like that who is obviously putting in the work, doing the work on the back end to say, hey, you know, I I try to be as positive as possible. And and in those low points, I just try to have gratitude for what I have right now and and not look too far ahead and just focus on what I'm doing right now. Yeah. And, you know, I think the more you dig into it, like when Toby was on, Toby Morris, when he was on Rich Roll, he talks about how, you know, he has his ups and downs and, and, you know, John Joseph talks about his ups and downs and every day is a process. And and that's why it's called the practice because you got to fucking do it every day, you know, and the more you do it, the, the, the more you can at least catch yourself in the moment like, yo, I'm going down this road and if I don't steer this back this way, I'm going to be down here for, for a minute, you know, and that's what I found is that, yeah, you know, like Uncle Steve says, you can't trust people that are fucking happy all the time and bubbly and just like, there's something not right, you know, life has ups and downs and and sometimes you just got to lean into it, but doing the practice doing all the work allows me now to be so aware of it and and to just either try to steer away from it or be like all right well this is where we're going to be for for a minute so we're just going to embrace it and and realize that like suffering whether it's self-inflicted or externally is part of the human experience and not every day is going to be unicorns and rainbow rainbows and puppy dogs and ice cream and and in those times when they're not, you got to have a practice or something, whether it's go throw the kettlebell around, go run for a little bit, go for a walk, just go, you know, turn on the Troy Casey video and do some breath of fire and try to pass, pass out, out or whatever, you know what I mean? But it, it is a practice and you have to do it every day. And, the, and the, you know, like a long time ago when I had Uncle Steve on the first time, he was just like, it's about minimizing the peaks and valleys. And they're not so, you know, the ups are not so up and the downs are not so downs. And you kind of minimize those and bring them together. And that's, you know, that's what we're trying to do is is put those people out there that have these cool stories and are into self-improvement and, and helping other people improve themselves and giving, giving things, giving information that is kind of maybe still taboo at this time and making people realize that, like, pharmaceuticals don't work for a lot of people and the more you dig into the pharmaceuticals the more you realize that it's just this money-making juggernaut and people really don't give a shit whether you get better or not you know because if this one does this we'll take this one and that'll counterbalance that and then the next thing you know you're someone like drew camusa god rest his soul rest in peace who's on like 17 18 medicines and it's like bro let's go fucking run around for a while and let's go eat some vegetables and, and maybe drink some green juice and fast for a day or two and, and or let's go down in the jungle and get weird yeah and i i think one of the things that is not taken into consideration enough is nutrition of how much that affects everything right how much that affects your gut and how much your gut affects your your mind and, and that's something that's overlooked and instead of putting someone on a 
an elimination diet for 30 to 60 days, it's like, all right, take these pills, take these pills, they'll, they'll work, they'll work. Instead of fixing the problem or the cause, right? You're just putting a Band-Aid over it. Well, and you know what the problem is, is that when you go to medical school, you know how much time they spend on nutrition in medical school? A week. Not that. even. A fucking <laughs> half a day. Yeah. You know, they spend that, a half a day on it when it's like... The most important the thing. The most important thing. How much can we fix just by, you know, it was Hippocrates, Hippocrates said it best way back when when he said, let thy food be thy medicine. You know, and, and sometimes that means stop eating. You know what I mean? Because even as lean as I am, I still have enough fat on my body to last me... 100 miles, 200 miles. You know, it might be slower, but that's just, that's science. It's not bro science. That's fucking science. You can look it up. Well, people just assume that, you know, their triggers get set off, that they're hungry, that they actually need to eat. But if you pinch your stomach, you're like, well, you could actually not eat for probably about 30 days and it would benefit you. Right. I'm starving right now. Are you really? Are you really starving? Because you don't look like any of those kids that were in the We Are the World video back in the day. For real. You know and what I'm saying? I, I remember telling someone when, when I was doing doing the fasting and, and you know only eating between certain windows, and they kind of looked at me weird. And I'm like, well, when I get hungry, dude, I just look at my stomach, and I realize I, that I have enough fat that I'm not going to die, and I'll be all right. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it goes back to just being educated and... and just because it's coming from this source or that source doesn't mean it's correct. And, and you know, these people that hold these hard lines is like, this is my world. And no, there's no such thing as conspiracy, conspiracy theories or, or what the government is telling me is correct or what my doctor is telling me is correct. You know, they call the guy that graduated last in his class in medical school? Doctor. He's still a doctor. And probably our doctor. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, Dr. Merchanian. Um, but like we see it with everything, you know, like people used to talk about, oh, you know, you're eating greasy foods. That's going to give you pimples. It's like, no, it's the fucking dairy. It's the gluten. It's everything but the grease from the pizza that's giving you fucking pimples. Yeah. You know, um, might be the cheese though. That's dairy. Yeah. Unless you're vegan. I said dairy. That was cool. I'm glad we got him on and I'm glad we squeaked it in and uh, definitely turned the day around and uh, would would really be interested in, in getting him back on and, and talking a little bit more. He seems like he's, uh, he's a pretty cool dude and I didn't even get to ask him like growing up as a, as a fan and then getting into it like who are, who are your heroes and, and you know they say often say you know you don't meet your heroes because they're going to let you down. Have you met those people and have they let you down? Yeah. No, I am... Um super stoked that Matt Seidel someone I've been a fan of for a long time listening to his Art of Wrestling podcast with Cole Cabana really enlightened me and helped me at a, at a spot when I was at a rough spot I remember the exact day shoveling the driveway after the Royal Rumble in 2015 listening to that and you know someone that just is like alright here's a guy who wrestles but he's also into these other things that I'm really into too so to have him on, to have him call and be like, oh, man, I, I blew at the time and to call and to squeak one in and, and get a little bit out of him. And, you know, we only got a little out of him, but it was pretty epic information and very smart, educated guy on what he talks about and what he's into. And I knew that was someone in the pro wrestling world that we could get on here and you would be cool with. And The consummate professional. Yep. Yep. So... Hope you guys enjoyed that one. I know I did. I know Richie did. Until next time, we are the Airy Bros. Much love. Namaste from the boys of 1512.